Hi, this is Renaud Duran from Sophist, and in this video we're going to cover the electrically caused fires and how to prevent them, as explained in this IEC 62368-1 standard, which applies to audio, video, IT products, tele telecommunication products, and so on. It's about the safety, mostly safety of users. Okay, so first quickly, Disclaimers, it's a high-level overview of the requirements. You still need to read the standard, which goes into a lot more details. And we're not lawyers or compliance consultants. Okay, so what you want to avoid, for example, is something like this. Okay, electrically caused fire. Now we could start uh, in the, here, or you could start on the product itself, inside the product, etc., etc. There's many ways that products can cause fire. Uh, these are just some uh, simple <laughs> Google image findings. Okay, now let's get into the standard. What does it say? First, it gives us a model for electrically caused fires. So you have an energy source, okay, and we'll get to that. It gets transferred to a fuel material, okay, something that can be ignited at a certain temperature. And that's how fires start that way because of uh, electrical energy, all right? That creates heat that is then somehow transferred to some kind of potential fuel. Now, the standard also gives us two models for protection, okay, against the fire. So first, you can basically prevent it. Between the energy source and the fuel material, you can have some kind of safeguard that makes sure it cannot be transferred over to the fuel material, okay? The second approach, which is not as good, but sometimes that's the best that can be done in certain situations. If you have an energy source, it can still reach the fuel material and maybe get it to ignite uh, under certain conditions. But then there is some kind of safeguard and typically an enclosure, some kind of casing around the product, for example, that will contain the fire so the fire then does not go out of the product, okay, or of, of a module of the product sometimes. Now, let's look at some concepts. So power sources for electrically caused fires uh, is PS1, PS2, PS3, right? Three classes of power sources, and it's usually at the level of a circuit that it has to be uh, evaluated. So as they say here, so these are our screenshots from the, the, the latest standard 2023 version. Electric circuit is classified PS1, PS2, PS3 based on the electrical power available to the circuit from the power source. Okay, and then like there's different conditions and so on. It is very good if you are looking at a, a product look at the, the design of a product and how safe it is. It's very good to have this kind of block diagram and then you say, okay, the main is going to be PS3. Okay, the rest is some other kinds of energy sources, right? Like electrical, for electrical shock and, and, and thermal energy, mechanical energy and so on. But let's just look at PS. So some are PS3, some like here are PS1. Okay, and also what kind of enclosure, if there is an enclosure, is it a fire enclosure? Uh, in this case, mm, might not be. Okay, but it's very good to start with this whenever possible. Okay, now another concept is PIS, not to confuse with PS, right? Power source. This is PIS, potential ignition source. And they say typically it can be created due to arcing, broken connections, opening of contacts, or from components dissipating more than 15 watt. Okay. And we'll, we'll go a little bit more into this. A few more basics. First, uh, what really counts in terms of uh, hazard, right, in terms of potential issues, ignition, is the worst case fault, okay? Don't look at the average case. Don't just look at the normal situation, but look at look at worst, worst case kind of situations. And the second key concept is if you have a power source, and then suddenly, for whatever reason, maybe there's a fault or some abnormal situation or something, it goes from 10 watt, which is considered pretty safe, to 200 watts. Okay, if it goes up to 200 watt for just one second, 
it's much less likely to start and sustain a fire than if it goes up to 200 watt for one minute okay so you get to start some kind of ignition okay first create a lot of heat start an ignition and sort of feed that ignition for some time that's when it becomes very very dangerous it can really start a fire in a building for example okay they have this definition about ps1 ps2 ps3 so ps1 is basically safe ps3 is very unsafe might lead to a disastrous loss of property or killing people and so on okay ps1 no more than 15 watts or if it's 15 watt no more than uh, three seconds ps2 well it's more than this but it doesn't go above 100 watt for five seconds okay and ps3 is more than ps2 basically and the way they show it nicely in a simple way is anything below 15 watt or up to 15 watt for up to three seconds is pretty safe if it goes up 100 watt or, 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 or um, something somewhere here but maybe uh, more than five seconds that is still uh, somewhat dangerous and then above above that is a very dangerous zone right for example 150 watt for 10 seconds already very uh, dangerous okay and they give us a bit more information about arcing and about resisting okay so these are the two main types of potential ignition sources maybe there's an arcing because of an open circuit voltage or, or some other things yeah i'm not going to read through everything and resistive um, potential ignition source dissipates more than 15 watt for longer than 30 seconds okay now let's go into what is very important is the safeguards okay so some basic safeguards uh, typically no, if no part of the equipment attains a temperature value greater than 90% of the spontaneous ignition temperature limit. Remember, that means the temperature at which the fuel might get ignited, right? And also no more than 300 degrees Celsius, I mean, which is considered very dangerous in general. And, and the combustible materials have to be of a certain class, and we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, but these are some basic safeguards there are also some um, uh, some other types of safeguards but this is all uh, explained in the standard now they make a distinction between a fire, fire barrier and a fire enclosure a fire barrier basically is sort of interposed between the the, the potential ignition source like where the flames typically might come out let's say uh, might, might start okay uh, and anything else that it can touch okay so there might be a barrier in in some designs and then sometimes there's what they call a fire enclosure so typically a casing that would go all around the the product without large openings close to a potential ignition source okay and you see again the class of the material right it cannot be very combustible typically for a fire enclosure if it's in a plastic injection molded uh, enclosure well the plastic should not be put on fire too easily and there there is there is an iec standard there's also a ul standard but they all refer to to this and it's they're, they're mostly aligned so hb provides less protection all the way to 5v which is very high protection and when they mention v1 that this this is the one they mean Okay, so I'm not going to go into the details of this. There is a standard about this. I hope this was useful as a quick introduction to the risk of electrically caused fires and how to prevent them. Thanks.